And then I want you to think about when you go outside in a, and you watch a tree in the spring. No tree ever goes and says, you know what? Let me just uh, grow a couple leaves, okay? Just, just, just a couple branches. And then let me wait. And let's see how that goes. Let's see how that feels. Let's see how people react. If I get enough likes, maybe then I'll expand and I'll grow more leaves. And, and if it goes really, really well, I'm going to go full bloom. Boom. There you go. No tree says ever. If it doesn't exist in nature, it is probably not a universal law and it probably doesn't work. I mean, that to me is the greatest concept of all concepts. White exists because of black. Gray is neutral. That means nothing happens. If you want nothing to happen, by all means, stay in the gray. I do not recommend it though. So be clear about your risk and the bucket of, I, I say it honestly, the bucket of shit that went wrong in your life. That doesn't ever help you anything to say, well, you know, a couple of things went wrong when I was 20, you're 60 now. So that is irrelevant. You're not 20 anymore. But if you want something out of life, you're going to have to put something in. And without a risk, there's no reward. Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Boomer women. Are we wise women? Are we mavens? Are we crones? Hell yeah. And we're also still curious, fun-loving, interesting, the list goes on. This podcast is for you. My guests are folk who have a message for our demographic. And if you want to hear a specific message, let me know and I'll find the guests. This podcast is also a conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it and we must perpetuate the art form. I try and let my guests have the greater say, and usually we fit in a good laugh or two. Listen in now to today's guest. The topic today, and thus my guest, is a bit of a departure from the usual. It's business. Now, you might be thinking business is for someone else, but I'm hoping Beata's story will keep you interested, and her expertise could well pique your curiosity at this midlife stage you're at. The teasers I can offer up are broke, single mom, immigrant, $135,000 in debt, created a company photographing the homes of the rich and famous, knowing she'd sell it one day. Spoiler alert. She did sell it to Bill Gates. She built another business helping people up their business game at any stage of that business, even beginner. And she wrote the book on the women's code. There is, mo there is more. I have my usual list of questions, so stay with us. Beata Shalette, welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I am pretty excited to be here. I think it's going to be a fire fast, honest, uh, hold nothing back kind of conversation. <laughs> That's great. You know, given the fact that we were first in communication in early July, I'm just so glad this is finally happening. Um, I would love to hear your story. You were born in Germany. This much I know is true. Can you give us more? Yes. So I was born in Germany. I'm probably like most most people in, in that sense that I just had a really hard time fitting in. And I always felt that the rules and regulations of how things are done just didn't make really any sense to me. And when I went to school, I wasn't the smartest. So my brother was smarter. My sister was smarter. They went, you know, Germany has three different school systems and three different tiers. I was in the middle of one. My brother and my sister were in the higher level. And so I was the dumb one in the family. And my father wasn't so much bothered by that, but my mother very much so. And when we go into these aptitude tests and we talk about what we are going to become, the 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 teacher or educator asked me what I wanted to be and everything that I wanted to be that I liked, you know, a photographer, a textile designer, a jewelry designer, everything was met with the same answer. Too many applicants, not enough jobs. And then her suggestion was, why don't you want to be a secretary? And 
which was a complete departure of what I wanted. And so I realized that this wasn't wasn't what I wanted to do. And then I took this aptitude test and over 16 pages and everything in Germany is always done very seriously, just in case anybody wonders. And over 16 pages, it's like asking you questions. Do you like being outside? Do you mind carrying heavy stuff? Are you afraid of heights? And, you know, and here you are, you're whatever, 15, 16 years old, and you cross out all these things. And at the end of this aptitude test, Agnes, it suggested I'd be a roofer. <laughs> you obviously weren't scared of heights. <laughs> So I'm I'm going like, well, this is amazing, uh, but not right for me. And then I became a photographer anyway. And there was this moment in my life where I am standing in Switzerland on a glacier and I was a photographer assistant. And I remember being on this glacier and my job was to get this Audi Quattro up on the glacier for a photo shoot. And I remember the helicopter like coming up, you know, over uh, inside, first you just hear the the rotor blades, and then you see the rotor blades, and then it comes up and up and up and up, and then underneath you see this big car hanging in this net, and then it flies over and it drops, and I'm like, I am outside. I am not afraid of hides, <laughs> and I'm definitely schlepping stuff. I'm doing exactly what the aptitude test said. It just was a different interpretation. It just wasn't shingles. <laughs> that's Agnes. Yes, that's when I learned that the other interpretation of what I was capable of or interested in just wasn't 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 my result, right? And that I think for the first time in my life gave me already permission to step out. And then I realized I was better at the business side uh, behind the creativity, and I ended up for you know my really my entire lives to work with creatives, visionaries, and people that have often big and crazy ideas and in the simplest of terms, I helped them land planes. And I went to immigrated from, from Germany. I was, you know, a photo editor at Elle magazine. I was 23. I'm running the photo department of Elle magazine. I'm making a ton of money for me at that time. And then I just didn't like fashion. And I immigrated to the United States, became a producer, a photographer rep, and then my decade of bad luck started and bad luck. I mean, you know, really big disasters, fires, floods, riots, earthquake, um, an employee betrayed me and started her business, which was my business without me. My invoices were paid to them. I mean, complete theft and misappropriation of trade secrets sued them and engulfed in this lawsuit. As I think I'm getting out of it, September 11th hits and I lose you know, lose a half a million dollars in the first in the in 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 the lawsuit for what they did. I lose my next half a million dollars in one day when September 11th hit, and I'm I'm out cold. But the lawsuit settled. It settles to kind of like zero, right? So I paid all my debt the first time, the first hundred thirty, and then I walked away with zero. So it was completely pointless to even sue them. I had nothing to begin with. I fought for a year, and I, and I had nothing. And then I started building up the stock photography syndication, which I knew was at the right time. It was the right idea. And it was like running up a spiral staircase in stilettos as fast as I could, but I had no money. So I, I went into debt again and again and again. And now finally I'm $135,000 in debt. And I'm going like, this is it. It is game over. I fly to Germany to drum up some business. My dad has a stroke. My father did not have a stroke. My father had pancreatic cancer. And so my father dies within six weeks. I'm at the funeral in Germany, you know, picturesque. We're out on this, 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 this little, little hill with a Baroque church overlooking the whole valley. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you hear, you hear them yodeling in the background, picturesque. And my phone rings into my office in Los Angeles. And they tell me that I've just been served a notice. So now we're losing the house. And I fell to my knees. I raised my fist and I yelled at God. And I said, if you have a plan this would be an excellent time to fill me in because I just couldn't fathom Agnes that at the end of the day, the joke was all going to be on me. And I got back. I got a letter from the White House, the White House, from the President of the United States. And it says, the President is delighted to hear from you. And I'm going like, sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the President did not see my letter. I mean, no. But it put me in touch with the Small Business Administration. And they helped me to restructure my business plan, helped me to find a bank, restructured my $135,000 in debt, freed up my line of credit, brought me to break even three months. That's it. That's all it was. Three 
month between bankruptcy and break even. 18 months later, I'm the world leader in my category. And that's when the Bill Gates company comes and says, hey, can you tell us how you do it? And I said, absolutely not. Like any decent woman, you want what I have, you pay for it. And they say, how much do you want? I said, millions. And they said, fine. And that's how I sold my business to Bill Gates. <laughs> okay. I'm going to back up a little bit here. How, <laughs> how did you even get in to start filming or, or photographing the rich and famous? I mean, that's a, a fairly elite circle. Yes, it is. But, you know, I think this is really sort of important, specifically for you podcast uh, to, to, to point out, because you always think that everything that happens in your life is seemingly unrelated or as I told the story, it's like, okay, so she was a photographer, she was a photographer assistant, she was a photo editor, she was a producer, she was a, a photographer representative, she was a stock syndication. So that's like six different jobs. But are they? So when I was building up this business, I was building an interior and architectural photography syndicate. And that was, interestingly enough, the idea that this bad photographer who betrayed me with my assistant, that's an idea he gave me. Talk about God not having a sense of humor. And I learned that you need to go after the A-list. Don't bother with C or D, just go straight after A. And when I did that and I secured the best photographers, the best photographers work with the best architects. They work with the best interior designers. And guess what they do? They designed the houses of the rich and famous. Next thing I know, I get Francis Ford Coppola, Terry Hatcher, Simon Baker, Naomi Campbell, Madonna, Julian Moore. And the, whole, and the stories just kept coming because they had been hired by the best how I get hired by the best magazines to photograph the homes of the best. And so I get all these home stories. Now I was a photo editor at Elle magazine. I used to buy these stories. So when they landed in front of me and they said, do you know what to do with them? I'm like, well, of course I know what to do with them. I, 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 and so I built up this network of all these countries and these these stories, I mean, they flew off the shelves like hotcakes. I, you know, I mean, if you have Madonna's house, how? I mean, my own skill set aside, right? And, and 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 let's just say I'm 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 super brilliant. But aside of all of that, it's really not that difficult to send sell Madonna's house worldwide thirty times. That sells itself. And so that's what I did. I built the whole syndication network, and that's that's what they bought. Is that the way I did it? Did you actually meet these people or did you, your photographers take care of everything? And the reason I ask you that is, I don't know, I was looking for a little story or something. <laughs> uh, well, the stories are that I I personally did not go to the celebrity homes because by the time that the houses were photographed, the story was already over. So that was the magazine that handled that with the photographer. And when I got the story, it was already, it came out of, out of embargo and it was ready for syndication. So I really didn't. I, I obviously met all my photographers and my photographers met all these people. I have met in my career many, many celebrities. And, and you know, my daughter went for her 12th birthday into the studio when Justin Timberlake had a photo shoot. And my friend called me and I said, it's her birthday. She says, come on over. Justin agreed, you know, to say happy birthday to her. So she went and she got a front chair while Justin Timberlake was being photographed. And, you know, that was like for Teen Vogue and he's doing the wet t-shirt and she's like drooling and it was very cute. Um, so, so Justin Timberlake is a very nice person. Seal is not. Cindy Crawford, don't get me started. Probably one of the, 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 the least pleasant experiences in my life. Francis Ford Coppola, complete professional. I mean, it's just the kind of people that they surround themselves with and how they manage their business. That's really the side I was interested in and that's the side I was exposed to. I have found that in, in my life, a true professional is always professional. They don't need to do all this like nasty stuff. That's, that's people that have low self-esteem because a professional will recognize another professional and uh, 
that did LL Cool J, very cool guy, you know, total professional, you know, immediately on the set. First thing he does is like, who's in charge here? Handshake, you know, eye contact, get stuff done. So that's the kind of stuff that I like, but all this like other stuff. I mean, there's plenty of it uh, in the industry, but juicy stories in that sense. I'm not really just really the dealings with the mostly publicists and, 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 and just that Hollywood behavior. Let's just call it that. Yeah. What I also heard you say there too, was like at the beginning when you're talking about setting all this up is I think too many people when they're starting a business, they think, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm such small potatoes right now. I'll just stick with, as you say, the, the C people. Whereas the worst possible thing that you had for the A people, the A list, is that you're going they're gonna say no and nothing changes. So you might as well, you know, just go for the gusto and uh take 100%. it from there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now I understand that you started that business knowing that you'd sell it. Now mm-hmm. most people start a business and especially one with that could be that high profile, and they sort of think this is gonna be their life's work. Why did you know that you were gonna sell it? Um, experience because I I had already built something to a million dollars and then I lost everything. And so when I built this particular business, I was very clear that the way I wanted to build it was an equity-based business with the goal to set it up and run it in this particular way that it was available for acquisition. When my friend Jeff Burke, who ran Food Pigs at the time, had sold his company for 70 million. Now I did not even get close to that number, but he did sell his business for $70 million. And we were on the rooftop in, in Lisbon and we celebrating his windfall. And he said, he looks at me and he says, what's your number? I said, what do you mean? What's your number? He says, well, what's the number? Everybody needs to have a number. You need to know what your number is. And when that number is offered, you know what to do. And I never had thought about it. And then I did, and I had a number. And so when I put the business up for sale for acquisition and the first question came on whether I was acquirable, then I put myself out with the other players, but I had a number. And then when when this Bill Gates company, Corbis, did give me that number, it simply the day came. So it wasn't on whether or not I was going to sell. Was it going to get more? Was it going to get less? It was, I mean, there was some, there were some negotiations, but then the day just had arrived and that's it. So I approached it like, like this. And I am now, interestingly enough, many, many years later, back at another point in this, I, I, about two months ago, I had this idea of how I was going to, make certifications, expert certifications available in the market because, and I think this is relevant to your podcast again, is that people don't necessarily want to work full-time. They may only want to work five hours a week or 10 hours a week. I see entrepreneurs and business owners struggle with the most fundamental things because they're so, so stretched so thinly. And then I had this idea and I said, what if I turn this business model around? What instead of trying to teach the entrepreneur, what if I train BAs and I teach them the workflows that we know work for growing businesses? And then I and then I team up with VA companies to partner them. And then we'll put this out because there's different certifications from sales, customer service to social media. And then we'll put it out in the market and we'll make it available for anyone who wants a side hustle or a new business, but on their own terms to say, you know what? I wouldn't mind learning social media. I mean, if, if I can learn it and I get the system and I can get certified in it, and then I have a VA company that might actually, where I can go to get placed and then they find me clients. Isn't that a winning proposition? So this is the first time since that moment, Agnes, where I have a very similar, you know, it just, there's just something about this that I haven't felt in a very, very long time. This has, this has a certain buzz to it. 
and I'm going to say that buzz is probably pretty accurate because you've you've walked this path before. Yeah. Yeah, there's a vibration when you hit an idea. You know, I think that's probably my 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 blessing and my curse because I I I'm I'm so in tuned with trends and 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 ideas and what's happening in the market. But when I look what's happening in the market right now is that there is a lot of fatigue to learning. People want to apply and they don't want somebody, you know, I think the internet marketing mania has kind of run itself now to a certain degree that people don't want to buy one more thing. They have lots of things. They now want to know how am I going to take what I have or how am I going to take something and how do I make money with it? And how is it tangible? And so when I looked at that, that's what creates that buzz because this is completely doable. If somebody only wants to work five hours a week, give me a couple months, I'll have something where you can only work five hours a week. Okay. Not I six, just, not I, seven. Five. I just felt a whole bunch of people lean in. To this, <laughs> to this okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with my notes a little bit. After you sold to Bill Gates two things happened. You wrote a book and you started this next company. Which happened first? Um, They kind of went hand in hand. I, after I sold my business to Bill Gates, I was asked to become the global director of entertainment for this Bill Gates company. And I naively and enthusiastically accepted. I had heard that it's very difficult to make the shift from entrepreneur to employee, but it was definitely a subject that interested me. And I wanted to know how these organizations worked. And I was shocked. I was shocked. I was shocked at how old school and old fashioned and just misogynistic and totalitarian a lot of these companies are being run. Like you, you know, I'd fly to Seattle to for a meeting. And then there was a snowstorm coming in and the CEO needed to leave. And so instead of just admitting that he needed to whatever, be somewhere else, and he didn't want to spend the time with me, he just came up with some sort of fake problem that I clearly didn't know about because I just got off the plane for this meeting and faulted me for something I never knew. I, I you know, and I'm, I'm just sitting there. I'm going like, what, what's happening here? And I realized that organizations are in really big trouble. The way this old business code runs that it's like all this old men's men's code thing that is just revolting in, in, in such a, such a way. I mean, you know, pregnant women are getting laid off and, I mean, who does that? And then I I came up with this idea after I left that women need a code. Women need a code to collaborate with each other, to learn how to turn competition into collaboration. And then to take that next step and say, the big battle is not us. The big battle is out there. And I, I was just amazed on how many women did not get that memo. And then, and then I, I built, you know, kind of like a business. I think it, to answer your question, went hand in hand. Okay. I'm going to stick with the book for a minute. In the Amazon book summer, summary, it says, in business and in her personal life as a single mother, Shalette noticed firsthand how women treat other women badly, how they boycott, bully, and backstab both in and out of the workplace. Now, there's a lot of women for whom that is not true. But as I mentioned to you before we hit record, it's almost like this dirty little secret. Like we know it's out there, but we're going to betray our fellow women by saying it's actually going on. Now, the women's code grew out of that. And I'm hoping you can tell us what you saw yourself personally, and then tell us about the women's code, please. Yes. So so basically, so I'm going to give you an example. I would... I would go to the bathroom around lunchtime. And then when I got out of the bathroom, everybody left for lunch and they all went together. And then when I, when I, when I, when I, when I looked and I said, oh, you all went to lunch together. Oh, we didn't know where you were. Oh, that's so interesting because it happened a lot. So every time I go to the bathroom, everybody leaves for lunch. Well, there's a story here that is clearly 
passive aggressive and clearly something's going on and there's clicking. You walk into a room and then there's this like, you know, weird, weird look where they, where you know that they just talked about you, but nobody comes and and, and speaks to you. And I, I was so confused about this because it's like, well, if you have an issue, walk into my office and tell me what it is and then we'll address it. Nobody ever did. And there was once this woman that came into my office says, I want you to promote me to a manager. I said, well, what are you going to do for me to see that you're going to be a good manager so I can I can promote you? She says, no, you have to promote me first and I'll, say, and I'll show you what I can do. And I said, you know that that's not the way this works. You have to display the characteristics of the person that you want to be or the person you want me to see as first so I can promote you. So I did not promote her. And then she was promoted after I left and she drove one of my employees that I had brought with from my company into a complete mental breakdown. She had to take six months off. She just, and clearly she was mad at me, but she terrorized this other, this other woman to the, to the point where she couldn't work. And I knew that she didn't have these capabilities, but, but there was just a sense of, of, I don't know if it's entitlement or if it's, it, it it's just so political and it's so it's so convoluted. It's like look, it's not complicated. Is the very very clear parameters of how you how you get ahead in life. You're gonna be you're gonna look at the person you need to be that can handle this, and then you see look for people that are successful at doing that. Then you emulate that behavior. You demonstrate that you have that skill set at that level. And then you ask for the promotion and then people will see that you're already that, that you are, you know, going in the direction, find yourself a mentor, do cross cross company promotions for yourself, you know, hang out with other people, just then your regular clique, hang out with the sales guys, build your alliance all over the company. That's how it works. And they didn't do any of this. And I was like, how can you not know this? Is part of that and, fear, fear based, you know, like if, if I try to build this up, properly somebody's going to see me doing it and do it first or do it better mm-hmm. yeah and it's it, well because then the then the the the, the 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 she tyrants are going to come out of the woodwork because if you're better and then i thought about this and in my book happy woman happy world the way i write about this i said i i gave this some thought and i have a theory around this the theory is very simple if you look at cave woman times so back in the cave the guys had to collaborate for survival. So John was the fastest. Jim was the best shot. Ellen was the best skinner. Uh, and, and Sean was the best strategist. They did not care if they liked each other. They did not care if the other guy was cool or okay. They simply looked for a skill set that was an addition to something the group needed to accomplish together. To this day, Men work like that. And then because this team then was responsible for survival, John owes Jim, Jim owns owes Ellen, Ellen owes Sean. And this is like kind of how this camaraderie comes together. Women, on the other hand, were by themselves in the cave, taking care of the kids, you know, keeping the cave nice and tidy, making the most of what we had. That was our role. Maybe collecting a couple of berries here and there. We may have walked to the river together to fetch some water, but nobody carried my bucket. I had to carry my own bucket. And so the if my Jim or John got killed, my only way of survival was to go after Sean or the other guy, or the other guy, and hopefully grab that person as my as as my as my provider. And then, if she allowed that to happen, well, that's on her. Women act like this to this day. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, can you address the women's code? I mean, like I I see it coming, but I want to hear it from you. So when I looked at this, I realized it's like, where is the cadence in this? And the cadence in this is that women 
most of the time are at their worst beginning in middle school, maybe mid thirties. And then as we get older and we see what the behavior does to our own children and we, we get cellulite wrinkles, we are not that hot anymore. We suddenly realizing that we fell for a narrative that's a common narrative that's fueled by media, that's fueled by the men's code, that's fueled by everything. And we just took it hook, line, and sinker. And then we realized I wasted so much time. I could have had all these relationships and friendships with other women. And that's when it turns. And that's when women typically, you know, then when we have friendships and then we would go, you know what? I'm sorry. I did that. I'm sorry. Um, I was like that. I don't want to be like this anymore. This is, I, I don't even know what I was thinking. I don't even know how I got to this point. And that's, I think, when when we get to a certain age where we just don't want to behave like this anymore because it's painful and it's lonely and it's miserable. And then we still see women who do it and do it to this day. And it's almost like you feel bad for them. You go like, have you still not figured this out? That this is a, it's a shtick, you know, you're, you're, you're being driven by, by media. I just read something today where a BlackRock's acquisition of the Reese Witherspoon company that she built to a billion dollars is not making what they are wanting. And the headline is, well, a Reese Witherspoon's company not producing results. It doesn't say that the people from BlackRock that bought the company were unable to grow it. It's about the woman because it's a better headline. And so that in the women's code, that's what I wanted to do is give women a code of conduct and some parameters to simply say, choose who you want to be. I mean, I don't want to be judgmental at this point in my time. I understand how difficult it is. I know how hard it is to be a working mom. I know how difficult it is to be to be financially stable, to to do all these things that are expected from us. I know we are constantly under fire. I mean, just look at what's happening in the market right now and how much women's rights and women leadership. I mean, who is even talking about women leadership right now? Nobody. We are always the first ones to fall. And unless women coming together, it will never change. And of course, right now, we have Iceland in the news, which is sort of interesting with their women's strike. So hopefully that would be a little light, a little beacon in the in the darkness. So what what is ego rhythm? Ego rhythm is a concept that I developed when my daughter took a breath one night and then did not take another. And I heard this really horrible sucking sound, you know, where she goes like and then it just stopped. And I ripped her out of bed, threw her over my shoulder, tried to wake her up. And then we found out she had asthma and an almost fatal asthma attack. And then over the next three years, I obsessed with it. And I went from doctor to doctor. And then one day she grew out of it. And I'm thinking, that's nuts. So this obsesses me for all this time. And then it just stops. But then another thing came. And then that thing stops and another thing comes. And then I realize that life is really a series of rhythms. So I call them ego rhythms, but I mean ego in the best possible way as into my own, not the ego that boycotts us. I, I kind of really don't like that term too much, honestly, because if, if we would be built wrong, God would have not built us like this. So I, I reject the notion that there's something wrong with us. But I wanted to have a positive term for my own rhythm, therefore ego rhythm. And I, when I dove into it, I discovered nine of them from, you know, tragedy, motherhood, transition to help women recognize. And I have a, a little assessment in the book where you can go in and say, which rhythm am I in? And then what women do is they want to be in all nine ego rhythms at the same time, because who doesn't want love, being a great mother, being in great health, overcoming tragedy and all these things. And i that's how I demonstrated the crazy making formula. And 
you want to set one main focus and the other rhythms are falling under that. So my daughter, for example, just had a baby. She's clearly in her mother ego rhythm. That is her priority. That's her number one ego rhythm. Yes, the career is important and she better be figuring this out, but motherhood is her number one priority. So the other ones fall under that. As you were saying that, I was reminded of, it's like a wagon wheel and like each spoke on the outside goes to like, I mean, each spoke is measured from like one to nine or something. And, you know, it's career, it's life, it's love, it's whatever, all those things. Um, and so often we are encouraged to maximize each one of the spokes, but your proposition makes so much more sense that, you know, like right now, perhaps, you know, the, the career isn't as important or like for me, parenting is no longer that big of a priority because my children are parents. And so that's their job. And I have time now to be developing my, my friendships or something like that. So I'm just thinking that it really makes more sense probably than that wagon wheel. Yes. And that's why I call it a wave or a rhythm because I, it doesn't mean that that cannot change, but I'm saying simply at this point in time, what is your main rhythm? And then own that. And you don't have to be apologetic about it. I mean, when you raised children and you worked your entire life and you're an empty nester and you're over the empty nest panic, and now you're enjoying your life, party on, girl. <laughs> I tend to use the word active. So I'm not active parenting anymore. Um, I obviously still love my children just as much. And if they needed something, boom, I'm going to be there. But because I'm not actively parenting, I can be actively something else. So actively <laughs> podcasting. Actively podcasting, <laughs> making an impact, making a contribution, helping others. Yes, 100%. Yeah, makes so much sense. Okay, from a business angle now, um, seeing as how you did that both, you call yourself a growth architect. What does that mean? So the term growth architect comes from that I looked at how my process works. And I look at the architecting of structures or processes or plans from what kind of house do you want to build? Is it a mansion? Is it a cabin? Is it in the mountains? Is it the is it is it at the is it at the ocean? How big it is? How many people need to be in there? Is it modern? Is it rustic? What what is it that you want? And then we built it based up on the parameters of how you actually build a business. You create a foundation. And then you are, you need cornerstones. You need to decide where the front door goes. You need to go which face way the house faces. But how you actually furnish the home, that I don't care. Green walls, blue walls, go ahead. High end fixtures, American standard, I don't care. But I help you to determine what does the overall architecture of this thing that you're building needs to look like. And then we build that. And then you get to decide what goes into that framework or into that blueprint of what we've created. That's why I call it growth architecture because there are repeatable processes. The outcome will never be the same. I mean, in all the times I've done, not one business is the same. Not one business owner wants the same, but the framework is the framework. I, I am led to wonder whether do women stand in each other's ways again, thinking, like, do you ever hear, oh, well, I know you set so-and-so up that way, but I'm different, <laughs> as almost like an I'm special, or do they just trust the fact that your certification in architecture is reliable and smart and the best way to go? That's a good question. I think that people, uh, especially women, vet a lot before they make a decision. And I would say that the decision, when people come to me, typically they've spent money with other people and they've got no results or they have a whole uh, a whole repertoire of stuff that sits there that they can't apply because it's not connected. I always say that in the, you know, the internet marketing language is about persuasion. 
It's about exploiting a fear and then selling to that fear a solution that they say is the only solution that fixes that fear, which if we really talk about this logically is completely BS. Rather, I would want anyone listening to say, look, what is it that you want? It's not good or bad. There's no one model better than another. You want to work 10 hours? Great. You want to work 40? Great. You want to turn on the heat for the next five years? Be my guest. We'll do exactly that, but you got to have that plan. And then we reverse engineer from where you are to where you want to go based upon the systems and the strategies that I know how to build. And then we'll map that out. Now, if if somebody comes to me or a woman comes to me and says, well, I don't trust your process, then they probably shouldn't be working with me. I mean, I have the track record. You know, I did sell a business to Bill Gates. If you go and you look up my name, I mean, I don't even know how many thousands of of things you're going to see. And, you know, and of course, I've had over 22,000 people in it. So there is a proven track record. I think everybody has to decide that for themselves, who who they resonate with. I am definitely a straight shooter and an OBS person. People come to me when they don't have time and they need results and they want shortcuts. If people need that fuzzy hand-holding, let's sit down, let's have a cup of coffee, let's talk about it, let's evaluate I'm probably not the right person because that's not how my my process works. My process is, what do you want? Here's the shortest way to make it happen. I'm thinking works for me. <laughs> I mean, how much time do you want to waste, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have three scenarios that um, I want to run by you. The first one is one of our listeners has a moderately successful company, but she wants to grow it as much as she can in the next five to 10 years so she can sell it for a bundle and retire well. What do you say to her? Well, I would first ask her, what is what does that mean, retire well? So is the idea to have an exit strategy as a sell? And then what is that number? So if she would say, well, my number is, let's say, $5 million, then and the $5 million is because when you make $5 million, you have to pay a million in taxes. And then you have a hold back for anywhere between three hundred and fifty to $500,000 for the next three years. So your cash payout is about $3.5 million. And then um, how are you going? So, so it's all, you know, we just have to really run the numbers and say, well, then if you invested the $3.5 million, how would we invest this? So that then gives you that uh, don't touch your, your principal uh, cash flow. And is that the lifestyle you want to live? Or are we going to put another million into a house and then we have $2.5 million and then what are we going to do and how are we going to invest this money? Or are we going to real estate property? So it it depends on, on how, you know, we first look at how she wants to exit. And then if I say she wants to be at 5 million and she's at a million right now, then I would say, well, you could get a 5X valuation now depending on what kind of business this is. But if she says, well, I'm a $250,000 business, she's not going to get a $5 million evaluation. I mean, it's just not happening right now, not in this market. So what would we need to do to get her to what revenue? And how do we need to set this up to look at the demonstrating the earning potential for this company? Because somebody buys a company because they think if they incorporate you in their process, then they can automatically double and triple what you're already doing just by putting this into their business. So we would have to look at what the sellability idea is of this particular business. So that's one. Or I would say, is it a legacy business? Do you want to hand this over to your children? And do you want to groom your buyer? And are you going to try to find, you know, and you want to be the CEO and want to get a president? And then eventually that person becomes the CEO and you become the chairman of the board until you exit. And you want to get to the valuation by having somebody pay with the earnings of the business your exit. That's a different strategy. That's a completely different, different, different model. The other strategy is to say, are you in a market where you can just turn up the heat? We know we are in a temporary business with a with a particular idea, which we've seen a lot since COVID. You know, like if you would have been in the PP. PPE, uh, a business with the, with the tests and the masks and the gloves, you could have made a fortune, but that was a moment in time, right? So a strategy at that time wouldn't have been, let's turn on the heat, let's put everything in it, produce as much as we can, sell as much as we can, and then we're done. We exit. 
it, you know, but we exit because the business then just goes away and then we sell it, you know, probably as it falls off to somebody else who wants to add our clients to their database, but it's not going to be a big thing because the novelty has gone. So the answer to that is call me and schedule your uncovery session. And then I'll tell you which of these scenarios is good for you. <laughs> okay. I'm already thinking, well, for an architect, you know exactly what questions to ask, even just crunching real numbers is something that is so many people. And as you were saying right at the beginning, it's like, I was going like, whoa, <laughs> we didn't have thought of that, but absolutely, absolutely. Okay, uh, scenario number two, some of our listeners are employees and they're starting to feel some ageism. They want to up their game so they continue to be respected and maybe even missed when they retire. Uh, I would say you are up against a rather uh, delicate undertaking. So what I would say is I would say you're going to have to get very clear that the number one thing you need to do is figure out how to make your age or experience an advantage. I looked at when I went through this exercise about two years back and I'm I'm 59. I just turned 59. So I'm right there at the ex boomer boomer mark. And I looked at women that have longevity. Let me just say there isn't many out there that do. Because the first thing the media does, like, oh, my God, she's aging. Well, look at her, you know, uh, or why is she always wearing pantsuits? I mean, this is like, seriously. So but I ended up with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I looked at her and I'm like, what made her what made her so successful? And I came up with the one thing she connected, not just with other women her age, but with the next generation and the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So if you want to have an exit that is being missed or you want to establish your experience, go into mentorship of another generation. Find a brand, and I'm going to say this in the most loving of all ways, that doesn't reek poorly aging feminist because that's not a brand that works right now. You can be a feminist all you want. I'm right there with you, but you got to look good. You got to, you got to, you know, whether you wear your leather jacket and the best sneakers you can find, but make sure that you have a brand that looks contemporary. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg did it because she had like her little, 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 little thing. She was a classic pearls, a pearl necklace, you know, bun. So she kept it on the classic pick a brand that's timeless and classic not cheap TJ Maxx or Ross. That does not work. And deliberately engage in activities where you say, um, I would like to create a mentorship program for the 25 to 35 year old women at our company to preserve our knowledge base of the company and to make sure that the experience is meshed with the new idea. Because that's what companies want. That's what what drives innovation. I I have to do a mea culpa here because I have often said, and it was only just recently, I can't remember who I was talking to. And I said, when I rule the world, um, I would love to see older employees. And I was sort of almost thinking like the management level, almost do a job share with a younger generation. But at any level within an organization, an older person can be a mentor to a younger or newer employee. So, yeah, wow. Okay, you just opened my eyes a little wider. So that was and and when you when you when you when you when you hit that mark, what people will say to you is, "When I get to be your age, I want to be like you." And at first, you go like, "WTF? What?" <laughs> and then you go, "It's a compliment." It's meant in the sincerest of all ways because they are saying, what are you doing that I'm even paying attention to you? Because my mother's not like that and my uncle's not like that, but I'm paying attention to you. So, but that's a deliberate branding exercise on to say, how do I make myself relevant? Instead of like, "Ah, nobody likes me, age is a man to say, what can I do to change that? One of my, catchphrases within my business is that just that basically at my age, our age, we are no longer the women that will change the world, but we will be the role models for the women who will change the, the world. 
and the accelerators. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll add that in. <laughs> and the accelerators, because okay, yeah. that is it. We have to take this part. And I cannot, I'm so glad you said this. We cannot emphasize this enough. If we don't make this part look good, everybody's screwed. We have to make this part look desirable and amazing. That's our relevance. That's our legacy. If we make this look, well, you know, da 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 and then she died. That's not a legacy. That's a sad story. But na 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 and then she made an impact, and then she got involved. People, you know, looked up to her. She inspired another generation. Now we're talking. Isn't that a much better story? Well, and I also maintain that you don't know who's watching you in terms of they want you to be their role model or they think you might be their role model. And so, yeah, up your game. And it's also more fun. It is way more fun. I I like the way you said that. (laughs) Yeah, up your game, girl. (laughs) 100% up your game. (laughs) Okay, scenario number three. Many of our listeners are looking forward to being done with the nine to five. Maybe they already are. Um, They've heard, and I took this from one of your courses, they've heard they can have success making a business out of their talents. Yep. What do you say to them? Yes. Take take the course. Go (laughs) go do it. Yeah, I did. I did a challenge called Passion to Profits Challenge. And I came up with a formula. Agnes, I thought about it. I'm like, how do I tell people what their earning potential is? And so I came up with this profit formula that I, I, I literally just tested. And I came up with an actual mathematical calculation. And the mathematical calculation is this much experience, this, you know, this skill times market value to come up with an actual physical, real, realistic number of what your earning potential is. And so I did that. And so now that we have tested it and the response was good, we I'm I'm thinking about how am I going to turn this into a quiz so that I can have people actually go there, take the profit formula quiz, and then identify how much money can I make. And then if they're interested in it, so there's there's really three pieces you need to know. If you have the idea and you know what the talent is and you just need the business model, then you know we offer something called turn your talent into a business. It's a it's a it's a it's a program, it's a 12 week program where we actually help you to build the business and implement and make all the things that so you're ready to go. Number two, you want a side hustle that is either where you already have an idea, then you go to the turn your talent into a business, or you want a side hustle and you don't know what that is, then you go into getting a certification for something because that's the piece, you know, I was talking about the certification that we are building to to really make this available for people. And if somebody is, you know, a manager or a director or above says a project management, easy peasy. There's money to be made working with companies that are entrepreneurial companies. Project managers are very difficult to find. So then go in the certification program that we are launching and get your certification based on the processes that we've developed that work for entrepreneurs. And then go and we are teaming up with these VA companies so that people can actually get placed for uh, for this skill. And then you can determine how much time you want to work doing the side hustle. So it depends on 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 which which route, which route you want to go. Do you want to replace an income? Do you want to stick it to the man? Do you want to be independent? Do you want to have some extra income on the side? You know, again, what do you want? And then we'll reverse engineer what we need to do to make that happen. I just love the whole concept of reverse engineering stuff. I, I know, it's right? Fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's just get down to the meat of the business. You have programs. Tell us, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm going to ask you to tell us about your programs, but every time I turned around and as I mentioned, I have bought your book and there's like, oh, I need to go to that site. I need to go there. I need to go there. Tell us about as many programs as you can reel off. Yeah. The top of your head. I would say specifically for your audience right now, I would probably you know, just, just go to Beata Gillette and uh, sign up for anything really so that you get on the list because we are, we are really knee deep into the certification program. I do believe 
that the market demands right now are because companies are laying people off, especially the most expensive and experienced people, because they always need an excuse to lay people off. And then they hire consultancies that bring people back on, but then they don't show up on the HR side. Then they show up on the contract side per product. And then they divert, they, they, they just put the expenses on a different line item. And then it looks like it's all different, which you and I know is a bunch of BS, but that's the way it's done. So I would recommend, you know, go and check out a uh, passion to profits.online because we're going to be running this again. And so we are building that, uh, we're building the list back up to open, open it again in version number two, as we are launching the product, which will be, uh, in 2024 in Q1 is when we're going to be launching with the first couple of certifications. And if you heard something that you're interested in, just reach out to me on LinkedIn or any of my social media, make sure you mention this podcast. Um, and while we're at it, please, will you go wherever you listen to this podcast and give Agnes a five-star review and leave a comment. And here's why the comment is so critical is because it shows the algorithms that here's engagement listeners that are actually paying attention. And even if it's a green heart, which means you listen to the entire episode, then um, it really helps Agnes to get this in front of more people and help more boomer women to, to not fade into black, but grow into legacy. I think that's a, that's a really wonderful, wonderful work that you're doing. And I want to just acknowledge you, acknowledge you with that. And um, other things that I do is I do a lot of entrepreneur programs where I develop growth strategies, uh, systems. So I would say just go to uncoverysession.com, fill out the fill out the, the 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 time slot, speak with a business growth advisor, and then we'll talk about what we can do, if anything, for you and help you to to make this happen. But I think there's a lot that we can do, especially right now. We just have, we, we can't be afraid. We have to be clear and strategic on how we are approaching this next part of our life. You were talking about fading and it occurred to me that fade in and fade out. So you can fade into Technicolor. <laughs> you fade, exactly, exactly. Fade into Technicolor, not fade to black. Thank you. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. yeah. It's a great visual, actually. <laughs> Bieta, our listeners are mostly mid-age women. What haven't I asked you that you want them to think about as they navigate this next chapter of their lives? They might have several more years in the workforce, or perhaps they've retired and they're looking for what's next. Risk. Risk. Oh, wow. okay. So the, the idea about risk is that risk is relating to trust. If you have this voice inside, you need to... Be honest with yourself and figure out how loud is that voice. If the voice is a whisper, you're okay. If the voice is already pretty loud, you must listen to it if, because if you don't, typically energetically stuff is starting to happen that you do not want. So if there's a voice inside of you, please do listen. A lot of women do not want to take any risks, meaning, well, you know, I've gotten this far. I have just a couple of years left. I can sit it out. Um, if I just, you know, if I just fly under the radar, this does not work energetically and it does not work in this environment. So if you have the thought, the idea, it means that the solution energetically already must be there. And then I want you to think about when you go outside in a, and you watch a tree in the spring, no tree ever goes and says, you know what? Let me just uh, grow a couple leaves, okay? Just, just, just a couple branches, and then let me wait, and let's see how that goes. Let's see how that feels. Let's see how people react. If I get enough likes, maybe then I'll expand and I'll grow more leaves. And and if it goes really, really well, I'm gonna go full bloom, boom. There you go. No tree says ever. If it doesn't exist in nature. It is probably not a universal law and it probably doesn't work. I mean, that to me is the greatest concept of all concepts. White exists because of black. Gray is neutral. That means nothing happens. If you want nothing to happen, by all means, stay in the gray. I do not recommend it though. So be clear about your risk 
and the bucket of, I, I say it honestly, the bucket of shit that went wrong in your life, that doesn't ever help you anything to say, well, you know, a couple of things went wrong when I was 20, you're 60 now. So that is irrelevant. You're not 20 anymore. But if you want something out of life, you're going to have to put something in. And without a risk, there is no reward. I, I'm going to add to that, too. You use nature as your analogy there. You know, in the spring, like everything's coming alive and you can't help but go like, whoa. And in the summer, we've got all these beautiful colors. And then in the fall, and we've got it here where I am, there's reds and oranges and yellows and just all and nothing's a, a, a wimpy color. It's all spectacular. So don't afraid, be afraid to be seen. You know, I think. <laughs> okay. Before we wrap, may I ask you a personal question? Go ahead. Where would you go back to first, Mexico or Iceland? Uh, I did like Iceland a lot. I was just so bloody cold. And I, I just got back from Japan. I would not go back to Tokyo. I would go back to Kyoto and uh and explore that probably also more to the japanese countryside because mm -hmm. there's just some some amazing amazing spots there always like to go back to prague prague's one of my favorite cities i think i want to uh, i'm going to costa rica next and then i want to maybe go to nepal next year so i didn't do a really good job of digging obviously i found <laughs> mexico and i found iceland <laughs> well i just got back from japan so the oh, okay. the the, the 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 images are haven't gotten up yet um because the way we we manage our social media is that we wait until I complete the trip so I can actually enjoy the trip and then we do and then the team goes back and then it posts and then everybody goes like oh my god you went to Japan again I said no I didn't go to Japan again I went to Japan once but the way we that that's just the way we do it I mean it makes absolutely no difference to the viewer on whether I'm there right now or was there two weeks ago well, I sit humbled because I always pride myself on digging and digging and digging. And as you said, you, know, you put your name into to Google or whatever your search engine is. Then it comes and, up. But you have to go through pages and pages and pages to get past all the professional stuff. But anyways, OK, where do we find you on the World Wide Web? Yes, go to beatichalette.com. That's my website. As I said, go to uncoverysession.com if you've heard something that you want to explore. I'm all over social media at Beata Chalette or Growth Architect. And if anything comes up, you know, just share it. I always like to hear what 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 the takeaways are and what resonated with you so that we can together help you achieve and reverse engineer what you're trying to achieve. Excellent. Okay. Your website will be in the show notes. All of the links, and I'm going to keep digging because I'm you just have given given us so many really good reasons to go to any specific website. Um, anyways, all the links are on your page at our website. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening, or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Beata gave us lots of reasons, and thank you for that plug. Your check is in the mail. The other thing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what question did I not ask Beata? Ask it in the comments and I'll get you an answer. There you go. Leave stars. Yeah, leave stars and reviews everywhere you can for all, all the obvious reasons. Share this episode. So many midlife women are at a crossroads. They want to scale up so they can go out in a blaze of glory or they've moved on from the nine to five, but they aren't ready for the rocking chair yet. They want to create some inc income, some impact, some fun. And as we've just discussed, so many younger people are looking to us older women as role models. Don't forget that. Beata Shalat, thank you for being my guest today and really incentivizing us to up our game. It's like, oh my goodness, I came in going like, okay, this is going to be interesting, but I just, I'm so excited now. <laughs> well, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that, that, I'm glad that worked. That's, that's really my my passion is to inspire. Without hope, we're nothing. We yeah, have to bring hope to the world. Yeah. Well, you inspire, but you back it up with like just the solid stuff too. So that that's amazing. Thank you, Thank you so much and have a great rest of the week.